now we're going to open it up for any questions that you have in regard to meat glue. Uh, let's see here. Is meat glue used in salmon? You know, it's used in, it's used in a lot, you know, I wouldn't say specifically salmon if, if we're talking about, again, if we're talking about a chef, if we're talking about a cook, what, what are they using? Are they making, are they patching salmon together? I've not seen that as much as I've seen uh, more of your red meats being patched together, glued together, um, but I wouldn't put it past them because they are using it in fish like crab. So um, again, I would, be, I would be cautious about that. Um, how can we, uh, let's see, we'll get to that maybe a little bit later. Have you, um, what's the best way to tell if ingredients use meat glue? That's a great question, Marcus. The problem is the, the food manufacturers don't have to display meat glue as an ingredient in the food. So the, the best way is to know where you might potentially find it. So that's going back to you know restaurants, uh, processed food, fast food. Those are all gonna be places that you can pretty much guarantee the use of meat glue. So the, avoiding those types of restaurants and those types of places, in my opinion, is gonna be crucial if you're trying to overcome you know, years of gluten-induced damage. This, so cell cultured fake meat, does it contain meat glue? I don't know. Honestly, I haven't. Uh, the cell cultured fake meat, I, I, I haven't even looked at it at this point. It's not widely available. Um, I know it's going through the rounds right now. It's something I would advise anyone to stay as far away from as possible. Um, you know, anytime we see this historically, right? So Anytime somebody comes out with this processed item and they say, hey, this processed food is better for you than this non-processed food. And look at the examples that we've already seen. Um, so, so remember when, when butter was demonized and they rolled out hydrogenated vegetable shortening and vegetable uh, butters, right? So if you remember like the, the Shed spread and the Mazzola spread and some of these brands really early, early on where they were hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils. They were taking corn oil and soy oil and they were forcing hydrogen into those oils with a, with a metal catalyst, meaning they were using a heavy metal to force, chemically force hydrogen into these plant oils and calling that safer than butter. And what did we find out? We found out after years and years of, of, uh, of consuming those products that they increased the risk for cardiovascular disease and other forms of inflammation and inflammation-based illnesses. That's, that's an example of when we were told, hey, eat this, not that, right? What else? We were told that, uh, that artificial sweeteners like NutraSweet or aspartame and sucralose were good for us, right? And go ahead and eat those. They're better for you than regular sugar. Well, first of all, sugar's not good for you, but these processed sugars are far worse. Many of them are neurotoxins. Many of them are genetically modified. So it, it's, um, it's, an, it's another classic example where, where we were told, eat this, not that. And, and again, the outcomes were, weren't, weren't good. They were, you know, what they told us was actually inaccurate and incorrect. Uh, and we see that time and time again in the food industry. Um, we saw that with don't eat fat, right? Eat carbohydrates. Fat's bad, carbohydrates good. And we went through the 90s thinking that, uh, you know, most people did anyway. And what happened? Diabetes went up weight gain went with obesity rates soared, heart disease soared, cancer soared, you know, all the primary, primary inflammatory degenerative conditions soared as a result of the dietary advice. So anytime you see something new coming out, like a meat glue or a cell cultured meat or like this impossible uh, plant-based burger stuff that, that's being touted as healthy, like my advice is run as far away from that stuff as you can. Let all the other humans be guinea pigs that want to be guinea pigs and you know, when their health is destroyed or deteriorated as a result of believing that garbage hype, um, you'll be sitting on the sideline being glad that you didn't participate in that, in that mass experiment. Um, so, you know, again, Filene's asking about how do you determine, you know, what might contain meat glue before purchasing? I would just say, when it comes to when it comes to it, I would call the manufacturer. If there's a real, if there's a particular product that you like and you want to use it and you want to continue to use it, I would call the manufacturer of that product and ask them if they use 
within their processing if they use microbial transglutaminase. If you can't get a direct answer, I wouldn't buy it. Uh, what's your opinion on Ayurveda? I, I think it's great. I think Ayurvedic medicine is a, is a wise system of medicine. It's certainly, um, in my opinion, a lot more helpful in regards to, to what we're dealing with in the world with the massive quantities of autoimmune disease and chronic degenerative inflammatory disease. It's certainly a much more comprehensive approach, let's say, than traditional allopathy where, where everybody you know, tries to use a drug to chemically manipulate a symptom versus people paying attention to the world around them and how they feel when they eat food and how they feel when they exercise and how they feel when they don't sleep. Like Ayurveda is just, in my opinion, it's just a system of medicine that's common sense. It, it applies fundamental things that we should all be applying, which is what or what? What are the seven fundamentals of good health? Now, the first is the right diet. It's eating, it's eating nutritious food, eating real food. The second is sleep. The third is exercise. The fourth is sunshine. The fifth is clean air. The sixth is clean water. And the seventh is stress management. And, uh, and having purpose in life. So if you've got those seven things dialed in, generally speaking, you're gonna be pretty healthy. And if you're not, you may be missing some key areas and it might be helpful to work with somebody uh, who's an expert to help you understand what you might be missing. How and what can we eat? This is so much to learn. So is it better to go to a meat market? Um, I love chicken and yogurt, so now no yogurt. Possibly, that's, that's true. Now, could you make your own if you love it that much? Yeah, I mean, here you have to remember, what have, you, what have we all done as a society? We've traded convenience for poor health. I mean, if you really wanna summarize it and put it in a nutshell, you, we've traded convenience for poor health, and that is the convenience of accessing food 24 seven, any kind that you want, but that food is all produced on an industrial scale. It's mass produced. And in order to do that, you know, these mass production companies use these types of enzymes, food preservatives, and food additives, they have to. They couldn't produce in small batches and, and you know, in the, in the way that we are demanding as consumers, the way that we're demanding food. So you have to look at the way um, you live your life and you have to say, do I wanna trade this convenience for, uh, for health points, right? It's a trade-off. If you opt for the convenience, you know that you're giving away some of your health and your stamina. And if you know that and you're willing to make that trade, then that's your choice. But if you don't want to do that, then you have to take more ownership of where your food comes from and how to produce it. And again, I'm not teaching this tonight to overwhelm any of you, but again, many of you go to that gluten-free food aisle and what are you buying? You're buying the box cereals, the box pastas, the box breads, right? You're buying the things that have the highest or the highest potential for being contaminated with, with meat glue. And that puts you at risk for not having recovery. And if we look at the studies on, on celiacs, and this is true even in my own clinic, the, the studies on celiacs and people with gluten sensitivity show that the vast majority of people embarking on a gluten-free diet have a benefit, but that benefit is minimized because of their foods that they're choosing in lieu of, and many of those foods are contaminated. Many of those foods have you know, gluten cross-contamination, meat glue contamination, food preservatives, food additives that cause leaky gut, uh, pesticides and other ingredients that are, that are um, you know, detrimental to the microbiome of the GI tract. And so those patients never recover because their guts are already destroyed and then they're trying to heal and repair by eating junk food. And it's just, it, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, it, it doesn't matter how inconvenient it may be for any of you listening to this. It doesn't work that way. If you wanna heal and you wanna repair, you've got to dedicate time to learning about this or you'll, you'll stay in, the, in, in that struggle. You'll stay lost in the mix. Um, is it true that beef grass-fed included is almost never fresh? I heard that it's at least three weeks. Yeah, they dry age it. Um, that's what makes it tender. That's where when you dry age beef, you don't have to use all the tenderizers. You know, those chemical tenderizers aren't very good for you. So that a lot of a lot of people will dry age cold air age, dry age it, and uh, that, that allows it to be more tender. And it actually get, does give it a better flavor as well. Is meat glue in all deli lunch meats? Pretty much. I mean, I, 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 I just wouldn't eat that junk, um, you know, unless you can verify that it's not. But in my experience, it, it's pretty much in all of them. Um, 
Are there any brands or suppliers of meat or dairy that are safe, that are certified to be free from meat glue? Not to my knowledge, although I would just say, um, Schultz, I would say that if you're looking for you know, valid companies where you can buy real food, this would be like your local farmer's market. This would be like your local, uh, potentially your local butcher if you have one, or your local farms that actually will do um, where you can buy like a, a quarter, you know, they do what's called cow sharing. So if you're trying to buy beef, for example, you can go in, you can buy a fourth of an entire cow and they'll process that meat for you without meat glue. And then you'll, you just have to put it in your freezer and you eat it as, you know, as you do. Uh, and that's what I would encourage many of you to do. That's probably one of the most economical ways to go about it. Is meat glue found in cosmetics? Is this something that can be absorbed through the skin? To my knowledge, no. Nobody's studied whether or not it's absorbed through the skin. And to my knowledge, I, I haven't seen anything about, about it being present in cosmetics. So I can't, I can't make that claim that it is. Um, is there any effort to require food label transparency or to ban meat glue? Um, also, with the Toxic Free Food Act recently introduced in the House of Representatives, help protect us from meat glue? Probably not. Um, there's no great effort, to be honest with you. And the reason why is industry. The industry, look, look we've got, just in the U.S. alone, we've got, you know, what, 340 million citizens here. And those people have to be fed. And in order to feed that many people, you, ha you, you know, the trade-off is mass farming, mass production farms. Now, could it be done in a regenerative way? It could be, but there's no will to do it because these companies that own the farmland and that run the farm operations are, are very complacent with using glyphosate. They're very complacent with genetically modified seeds. They're very complacent with the food processing and the additives because they're making a lot of money doing it and they don't want to restructure their business or their company. Um, it's just not something anyone is going to want to do. So th there's no will to do it. As a matter of fact, there's the anti-will against it because by doing it, it would, it would, they, everybody would incur more cost. And usually with changes like that, they have to be forced and mandated. But, you know, again, when you have, you know, when you have what we have in today's world, which is just the vast majority of politicians aren't on the straight that, you know, who goes into politics? People that go into politics generally, uh, well, I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to get political, but I think you guys get my gist. Is it possible for uh, meat glue to be in fruits and vegetables? Um, you know, again, I would say where you'd want to look out for is if you're, if you're buying like processed, you know, so like your, your highly processed, you know, vegetable puree mixtures and things of that nature, that's where I might suspect something like a meat glue to being added as a texturizing agent, but fresh fruits and vegetables, no. Is there a credible visual source of meat glue that I can share with family members? I, I don't know what you mean by credible visual source. Of meat glue. Maybe clarify that um, and I can give you a better answer. Is it, is it meat glue? Cheryl wants to know, is it meat glue in Chinese restaurant food that makes us sick? It, it can be, but it's also um, MSG. A lot of people get, um, you know, get severe neurological complications when they go to the Chinese restaurant because of the, the heavy, heavy monosodium glutamate use. Um, is there is there meat glue in organic dark chocolate? It shouldn't be. It's not anything I've ever seen. Um, but again, I, I don't I don't want to say no because I, I can't say with a hundred percent certainty that there couldn't be. Yeah. So so forest squirrel is saying avoid meat. You did not take part in. Well, that's you know part of why I, I grow my own. Part of why I have my own animals is um, is that very reason. I I, I really don't trust. If you look at, at trust in society today, look what's happened in the last hundred years. We've given our trust to farmers. Well, what happened? The farmers you know, took, took government subsidies to grow the crops that make us the sickest, right? They took government subsidies to grow genetically modified corn, sugar, soy, uh, and, and hybridized wheat sprayed with tons of chemicals. And they took those subsidies to grow those foods because they made more money to do that. So the government incentivized food growth that actually led to the deterioration of the health of us, right? So here we had this trust in our government. We also had this trust in farmers. That trust was breached. How many farmers today are farming conscientiously? There are very few regenerative farmers. I mean, if you want to look up 
in your area, look for regenerative agriculture. Farmers that are doing regenerative agriculture, that, that's really, in my opinion, where farming needs to go. Now, that being said, we've trusted our government to take care of our food needs. And what they've really basically done is they've slowly poisoned us and they've slowly, um, through, in my opinion, poor ethics, allowed more and more food additives, more and more chemicals into our food with the guise that they're safe. And if you look at who owns many of these chemical companies that are food additive manufacturers, they're drug companies. So it's, it's, it's a classic example of the fox in the hen house. So, so the, the, the pharmaceutical manufacturers are producing the poisons that we spray on our foods. And when we get sick after eating these poisons for years, they're also producing the drugs that we end up having to take or that many people end up taking uh, in an effort to get better, right? And, and so it's just, I don't know, it's a lifetime value customer acquisition issue, right? Where you, you start the babies off on baby formula from genetically modified corn syrup and synthetic vitamins and you graduate them up into hot dogs and chicken nuggets that are processed in mass scale and then you graduate them up into you know more and more foods as they choose as adults fast food processed food and again it's just a vicious cycle of, of uh, uh, again of, of complete distrust and so at this point my, my point in saying all that was not to demonize anyone but just simply to say I don't trust other people's food I don't trust other people with my food and I just encourage you guys to take a greater degree of ownership of where you're sourcing your food. You don't have to own a farm to take greater ownership. This is what that means is you could join a food co-op where they're growing food in the local community organically and you're just a part of the person that funds that and so you get organic produce fresh to your door seasonally delivered. That's the kind of thing I would encourage many of you to do because the more you take your dollar away from these mass corporate companies that are producing this junk and you give it to that farmer who's regenerative farming and doing it right, right? How do, how do we make this paradigm shift? We talk with our dollar bills, we don't talk with our mouth. There's tons of people on Facebook right now moaning and groaning about how bad things are, but that doesn't accomplish anything, right? At the end of the day, what, what talks, right? Money talks and you know the rest, BS what? It walks, so you've got to talk with your wallets and, and your health, um, and so anyway. Let's see here. Visuals of meat glue found on Google could be photoshopped. Is there a medical or clinical source to know how that it could be credible and not photoshopped? No, not really. Um, not to my knowledge. Yeah, so Barb's saying, if, if not able to buy a quarter of a steer and no large freezer, what would we look for when buying beef in a store, grass-fed and grass-finished? Yeah, that's it. You'd look for grass-fed grass finished and you you try to find out what farm it was being produced on and you might even do a little bit of homework on that farm and see what you know what their philosophies are and whether or not their philosophies match yours um and, and then support again a support a business that that um that has a like mind what would be worse if we had no choice on the on the road a mcdonald's burger patty or the bun it's all bad, man. I'd say if you're on the road, you have a choice. Don't eat. I, I fast all the time when I travel. I mean, when I when I go places and I'm on the road for, for several days doing conferences or, you know, uh, uh, out teaching other doctors or other folks, you know, we fast. I fast on a regular basis. Uh, and so, you know, I'd rather fast. I'd rather skip the meal than end up compromising, you know, my health. Because when you're traveling, usually what is that? That's airplanes. So you're on this tube full of germs, full of people where you run the risk, the greatest risk of your immune system being compromised uh, or being exposed to something. And then if you eat food that compromises your immune system further, you just increase your risk for the development or for, for something bad to go wrong. So fasting, in my opinion, would be the better option over either of those. I don't believe in choose, I don't believe in, if people say, pick your poison, I would say, why? Pick, pick something healthy instead. Don't, don't, don't justify poison by picking the lesser one, right? Because that all you're really telling yourself mentally is that it's okay to eat poison, right? And you're, and you're telling other people around you that that's okay. So if you've got children that are watching you, you know, you're, ju that you're justifying that for them. Okay, let's see. Yeah, meat, glue, and pets food. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. This is one of, I mean, look at pets. If you look at, at, the, at the veterinarian industry, over the past 50 years as well. Look, we didn't have dogs with cancer and heart disease and 
taking diabetes medication 40, 50 years ago? Not to any great extent. This goes back again to the trust. Not only are they poisoning, you know, the, the mass scale production food creators are poisoning our animals as well. So you, yeah, I mean, I feed my animals. I have, you know, I have a German shepherd and I have a, a little Yorkie and we feed them raw food. Um, so, you know, the, the, there are some brands of kibble that are better options, but ultimately for, for, for canines, raw food is a, definitely one of the better ways to go if you, um, if you can stomach it yourself. Let's scroll, is pig blood sausage okay? You know, it just depends on, on you know, is, is there something inherently wrong with pig blood sausage? Not necessarily. I would say, one, it depends on how well you cook it. And two, it would depend on the source of the pig. If the, you know, there are certain kinds of pigs, you know, if that pig were raised on a mass commercial farm, I wouldn't need it. Now, if it was a wild boar or wild animal that was shot like wild game, yeah, I mean, that, that, I would say that would be a much better bet. Is hamburger, even the grass-fed organic kind, high in meat glue? No, not typically. Again, when you're buying, typically at the grocery store, when you're buying uh, meat, you're getting meat and there's less, it's less apt. I mean, you're less apt to get the meat glue, especially if you're buying grass-fed, grass-finished and paying a premium for it. Let's see, is there a link between gluten sensitivity or celiac with histamine intolerance? Yes, there is. Um, we're actually getting ready to do a major show on histamine. So if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, make sure you do that. You can visit me at glutenfreesociety.org and you can sign up for our newsletter there. But um, we're going to do a major show on that. And if you're on our newsletter, you'll be, well, well, you'll be given well advanced notice of that. And we're also getting ready for those of you. We're getting ready to make a shift. Um, we're moving a lot of our, our video and our platform off of social media. And, and the reason why is I'm tired of being censored. When we, when we have a topic that we need to talk about and I need to educate you, I don't want to be censored. And I don't want to worry about my entire platform going down. Uh, I don't want to worry about, uh, you know, problems of that nature. So we're, we're working on a technology solution that will allow you to come and visit us at Gluten-Free Society and still partake in these live questions and answers, but using our own technology base. So sign up for our newsletter and we'll keep you informed when we make that switch. What supplements can one take to strengthen their bones and their jaw? That's a little off topic, but I think the bigger question is why would the bones in your jaw be weak in the first place? Um, and so there are a lot of different supplements that help with bone formation, but if we're just talking about basic bone formation, collagen, vitamin C, zinc, copper, calcium, manganese, boron, and vanadium are all really good bone building nutrients. And so in that regard, a good, if you check out my multivitamin, my multinutrients, it's, it's, it's full. It's got a little bit of all of those things except for the collagen. And we do have something called ultra collagen that you could take as well that has bone collagen in it. And those are all good ideas to help support healthy, dense bones. Let's see here. Just keep scrolling down on both sides for me. Do veggie burgers have meat glue? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't say, I can't speak of every brand and say, yes, that one does, or no, that one doesn't. But I would suspect it. I would highly suspect it. Um, with anything, again, any of the soy-based, veggie-based types of concoctions where they're trying to make it look like a hot dog, taste like a hot dog, taste like meat, the, the probability of meat glue is pretty high. Uh, would meat be, glue be found in frozen vegetables? Not to my knowledge, Louise. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suspect frozen vegetables as being a major source of it. If you don't have freezer space, oh, so that's a comment. Somebody's chiming in. Yeah, and I, that, you know, somebody mentioned they didn't have freezer space. One of the things I would just say, um, <laughs> if I'm just trying to give you good advice, buy a freezer. Um, they're relatively inexpensive nowadays. I mean, you can go over to a major hardware store and you can buy a, a smaller deep freeze 
for under two hundred dollars, especially if you pick up uh, pick up one on sale, and uh, and then you just have to have room to put it. Just have a little space, either in your garage or a closet in your house, and, and plug that thing in because you want food security. I mean, this is a, the time. This is the time in a world today where we live. You want to always have food security. What I mean by food security, we're 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 living in a time where shortages can actually happen, and and uh, it's not that we've seen. You know, you, you saw last year where there were some shortages in the grocery store shelves were uh, on, on days they were vastly emptied. Um, but food security is just, you know, when you struggle with food sensitivities and food allergy or celiac or gluten issues, food security is important because you don't want to get stuck in that, you know, do I eat or do I starve situation because there's not enough options for you to buy that are healthy options. So having that freezer gives you that security in that, uh, in that backup that you may, you may need one day. Hopefully you'll never need it. Hopefully none of us do, but you know, the old saying is um, chance favors the prepared. So do your best to get prepared now so that if you need it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, can I repeat the name for meat gluten ingredients? Yes, microbial transglutaminase, MTG, is the name of, of meat glue typically. Um, let's see here. Would meat glue be found? I uh, say I answered that one. Uh, my opinion on grounding, oh, that's really off topic, but I like it. I, I go outside all the time. I like grounding. I like being you know, barefoot in the grass. Um, and there definitely are positive health benefits to doing it. So I like this question. Lynn says, I took the genetic test in it and it was positive with two of the gene HLA-DQ to uh, alleles, how come the rest of my family are not sick like me? I have three sisters around 50 to 60 years old and my mother 92 and in good health. It's, 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 very, it's a very interesting question. And I think when we try to compare ourselves to others, it's, it's oftentimes it's a losing comparative because you're uniquely you. Um, but but it, is a, it is a good question and it's a fair question. And I think from what I've seen, and I've been, you know, I've been practicing for over 20 years now, and what I've seen is that a lot of times one person in the family may be sick, the others, maybe they're healthy, but they're not. Healthy on the surface is not the same thing as healthy. So what do I mean by that is many people don't complain about problems and they're very stoic and they just push through their day and they, you know, they don't complain and they look healthy relatively on the outside. And I'm not saying that your family is this way, Lynn. I'm just simply saying this has just been my experience and that a lot of people ask me this question and say, well, this person's healthy. And when I talk to that person, that person's not actually healthy. They're just not very verbal with their health complaints. And so they, they don't really talk about it openly or they're not, they, you know, they, they're, or maybe they're not in such a severe way um, as, as some people can get. But there's the saying, uh, you may have heard it, the canary in the coal mine. And some of us that get the sickest uh, are the warning beacons for those of us who aren't quite as sick yet. Meaning that some people have constitutions that are a little bit stronger and you may be the one that in your family doesn't have that. And there may be some, also some history there with you where you took more antibiotics or where you were exposed to certain elements or certain aspects, certain toxins. And so that accelerated the process of by which your health deteriorated. It's just hard to say because everybody's so uniquely different. Uh, let's see here. So back to that, yeah, that osteoporosis uh, question. So I have osteoporosis because of my condition. I know I'm off topic, but I want to order supplements. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the best thing you can do, Mary, in that regard is get tested. Ask your doctor to order a micronutrient analysis on you where, they're, where he's looking at whether or not you have deficiencies of certain nutrients because you, you may need calcium and you may not. So many people think that osteoporosis is a disease of calcium deficiency and if that were true, then there would be no osteoporosis because all we'd have to do is give everyone calcium. So it's not that simple. It's, you know, your bones are built from proteins. They're built from micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals. And so knowing whether or not you're low in those is gonna give you an advantage so that when you're ready to buy those supplements, you can get super, super specific. But if you're just buying generalized and you just wanna buy something to support your overall good health, I recommend a really high quality multivitamin to start with. So somebody's asking about um, zinc as a sunscreen. 
Will taking it as a pill act as a sunscreen? No, it will not. Um, taking it as a pill is not going to give you um, the same kind of sun protection. Now, zinc is an antioxidant, so you should be aware that it drives an antioxidant system called superoxide dismutase, which does protect your skin from radiation. But taking oral zinc supplements is not, it's not the same thing as applying zinc oxide as a sunscreen. That zinc oxide is going to be a lot more effective from the acute exposures, especially if you're on a boat or at the beach or something like that. Let's see. Would meat glue proteins pass through to breast milk? Potentially, we nobody's really studied that, Angelia, so I, I can't say with definity that that would happen, but we know this. Um, we know that gluten passes through in the breast milk, as do many other allergy complexes that form in, in allergenic moms. And so that, that it's, a, it's not a leap to say that meat glue could show up in the breast milk. So can you detox meat glue? So yeah, that was the title of tonight's show. How do you detox meat glue? What's the number one rule? The first person that can answer this question properly, uh, we're going to give away a free gluten-free warrior t-shirt. Um, so the number one rule for detoxification, type it in. First person that gets it right gets a free gluten-free warrior t-shirt. I'm going to come back and answer that question in just a minute. Do meat process companies ever put meat glue in meat without our knowledge? That's a possibility. And that's why you ask. You know, if you're taking your meat that you grow on your own land, um, then then you know the, the truth of the matter is, you know, that's pure meat. But now you're taking it to somebody else to potentially process it. You, you have to ask that question. You have to have that conversation with the butcher. So we're getting lots of answers here. So the, the question was, what's the number one rule of detox? And so number one rule of detox, and, and this is, it's very specific, the number one rule of detox. And so we've got, let's just read some of the answers that we got. Cynthia says, don't eat it. Maxine says, get it out of your diet. Christy says, fasting. Lynn says, stop eating bad food. Jane Jones says to fast. Uh, Elizabeth says, avoid any food product with meat glue. I like Marie's answer, follow no grain, no pain. I'm, I'm biased that way. Thanks, Marie, for the shout out. Um, let's see. Technically, nobody's gotten the, the exact answer the way I want it worded yet. Um, the number one rule of detox, and, and this is for any detox, the number one rule. So keep trying. We're going to come back to it. Uh, let's see here. Keep going. Uh, we ran out down there. We still got answers coming in. Um, keep scrolling down there. Let's see if we got anybody with the right one. So a lot of good guesses. So that's good because I'm going to be teaching you all something tonight. And I know some of you know the answer. You're just not wording it the way I want it, want it worded. Uh, the number one rule of a detox, number one rule. So a lot of you, it's funny because a lot of you are angling toward what to take or what not to eat. But I'm going to go ahead and answer this question and we're going to, we're going to give it to the person who got it the most right first. So back it up on the left. Keep going, keep going a little further. So that would have been Cynthia, because your answer was correct, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Cynthia said, don't eat it. The number one rule of any detox is to not retox. And what do I mean by that? So whatever it is that's, that's creating the toxic effect, you, you, have to, you have to avoid that first, because no amount of pills, no amount of, fat, no amount of uh, let's say, because if the toxin is not edible, if the toxin is breathable, 
you know, then fasting is not going to do it. Um, and, you know, taking more vitamin C is not going to overcome continued exposure to a toxin. Taking any supplement is not going to overcome that. So the number one rule in any detoxification program is to not retox. And so you have to eliminate where the toxin is coming from. And that means filters, right? Your body shouldn't be the major filter. You should filter your air. You should filter your water. You should filter through the lens of intelligence and discernment. You should filter your food choice so that your body doesn't have to do all the detoxification work and become overwhelmed. So we're going to send you a t-shirt. Um, uh, who, let's see, who won that again? Uh, Cynthia. Cynthia. Yeah, we're going to send you a t-shirt, Cynthia. So thanks for participating in, uh, in the live Q&A tonight. So just um, get, with, get with Mel um, or get with, uh, get with my team, get with Jessica at glutenology at gmail.com. And we're gonna we're gonna pass along your information over to her so that she can get get a hold of you and make sure you get the right shirt. The only thing we ask of you to do is take a nice picture, and send it over to us. Okay, let's we'll see if we got any more questions before we wrap it up tonight. Yeah, the answer was too obvious, wasn't it? I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Everybody's thinking for that deeper answer, but sometimes it's just super obvious. And um, anyway, I think we got. I think this. I think this has got to be a record um, where we where we got through. I think most of the questions. There were there were several questions that I didn't answer because they were just so far off topic that I just didn't want to dilute uh, early on the show. But hey. Thanks for joining me on Monday night. I'm going to go home and have dinner, and I hope that you do the same and have real food, not meat glue. Uh, I'm personally going to have tonight's a ribeye. I'm going home and I get to barbecue it. So um, I hope you have a great meal. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. And again, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. If you're not already, sign up for our newsletter there. We'll send you a bunch of free information that might just save your life. And if you think this information has been helpful for you, please do us a favor. Our goal and our mission here is to save 100 million lives. So we appreciate you sharing this information and helping us get it out there. With all the censorship, it's harder and harder to reach folks, but, uh, but we're gonna reach that goal. Hashtag save 100 million lives. You guys have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.